Well, intra-arterial calcification, I think, is one of the biggest challenges we currently have with endovascular therapy. It seems to be increasing in prevalence as we're seeing patients more at risk for calcification, older patients, patients with chronic renal failure and diabetes, for example. And our current technologies don't deal well with calcification. Angioplasty doesn't dilate these very rigid vessels very well and risks dissection or even rupture. Stents are often not strong enough to deal with the calcified stenosis that we see. And then we have to go to more invasive procedures like atherectomy with its embolic risk and cost and time, uh, length of time, or even open surgery. So we really don't have or haven't had good solutions for these heavily calcified arterial lesions. So the DISRUPT3 trial is a, is a really interesting design trial. As you know, uh, there are two arms in the trial. There's the patients randomised to having intravascular lithotripsy with shockwave followed by a drug-coated balloon to patients having a plain balloon angioplasty followed by a drug-coated balloon in these heavily calcified lesions. But there are a number of patients who come forward whose anatomy is outside of the inclusion criteria of the DISRUPT PAD3 trial. So there's a larger observational registry that these patients can tip into, and also some other patients who were never going to be in the trial who had the anatomy suitable uh, for shockwave therapy. So what this represents is a much larger registry, actually hoping to recruit up to 1,000 patients in this registry. Uh, and this reflects not only the use of shockwave in the femoropopliteal segment, which is what the DISRUPT PAD3 trial is evaluating, but also in other anatomies, such as the baloney arteries, but other locations like the common femoral artery and the iliac artery and, and other locations. So it gives us an opportunity to really understand how often the device is being used in these, uh, in these locations and the acute procedural outcomes that are adjudicated by an independent core lab. Maybe I can talk a little bit about what we know of the, of the observational registry so far. So, so far we've had a look at the first 200 patients in the observational registry, and we've learned quite a lot of uh, very useful things. Firstly, the majority of the use is in the femoropopliteal segment, but uh, there has been use in the common femoral and the iliac arteries, as well as below the knee. There's been, a, there's been quite a high use of ancillary procedures, as you'd expect, in the femoropopliteal segment, the vast majority of the cases have been shockwave intravascular lithotripsy followed by drug-coated balloon angioplasty, which is our standard of care for these calcified lesions in our institution. But there's also been uh, a small number of patients that have had, for example, atherectomy in the femoropopliteal segment combined with shockwave intravascular lithotripsy. There's also been, uh, for example, in the common femoral artery ancillary procedures, again, often a drug-coated balloon angioplasty after intravascular lithotripsy is all that's needed. And not surprisingly, this uh, device has been used in calcified occlusive disease in the iliac arteries, where the device perhaps opens up the largest balloon is seven millimetres. So although it's done the deal in terms of changing the uh, plaque compliance, a stent has been needed to keep the vessel open at a larger diameter. So we're seeing stenting in a low incidence uh, below the inguinal ligament, a little bit higher in the iliac artery. When we look at the outcomes, uh, the post-procedural outcomes in this much more hostile group of anatomies, and we compare, say, the femoropopliteal outcomes to the much more controlled disrupt patients, we're actually seeing very similar acute outcomes. So we can see there's a higher incidence of ancillary procedures like drug-coated balloon angioplasty, but we can see the same kind of results with much more hostile anatomy, which is surprising but very reassuring. Well, the common femoral artery is a really interesting uh, problem. We often see calcified stenotic disease in the common femoral artery, and traditionally the operation to manage that is a femoral end arterectomy, an open, open surgical procedure. We've often thought this is a no-stent zone because it can uh, cover important branch arteries such as the profunda and the superficial femoral artery. So really there will be a group of patients who are at high risk for an open surgical procedure that would really like to have an endovascular solution. And as soon as uh, when we first saw shockwave, we thought maybe this would be a solution for calcified common femoral artery. So Marianne presented the very early experience uh, with dedicated treatment of the common femoral artery with intravascular lithotripsy. And as I mentioned, uh, 
demonstrated very pleasing acute results and some longer term follow up that showed not a high incidence of restenosis. Many of the patients also got drug coated uh, balloon angioplasty to follow as an anti restenotic therapy. But I think what this does do is it indicates that we now have an alternative endovascular treatment for the common femoral artery, which traditionally was a non endovascular uh, zone. So, very encouraging results. Well, we do often see calcified iliac arteries. Uh, not only can that produce leg symptoms such as claudication or critical limb ischemia, but of course, increasingly we're wanting to use the transfemoral approach to prepare or to repair either aortic valve pathologies with TAVI procedures or thoracic or abdominal aortic aneurysms or dissections uh, with endografts. And these are large caliber devices, you know, often uh, 14, 16 French, but with the thoracic devices up to, you know, 22, 24 French. So to achieve this, there is a significant risk of uh, rupture of these iliac arteries that are heavily calcified. So ideally what we need to do is try and change the compliance of these vessels to minimise the risk of rupture while we're dilating them. Rather surprisingly, and as I suggested before, with the largest uh, intravascular lithotripsy balloon currently being seven millimetres, you would think, well, that's not going to be big enough to allow this. But what we've learnt from the studies, which has shown that you can actually allow delivery and post-dilate often to much larger uh, diameters is that lithotripsy is changing the compliance of this calcification, making it much less likely to crack and rupture. It just dilates in a much more controlled way and I think this is very encouraging as we're doing more and more thoracic aortic valve and abdominal aortic intervention in these patients with calcified iliac arteries. Well, we've been very lucky in our institution. I was lucky enough to do the very first IVL cases in the world, so we've got a very long history of this. So I've had the longest follow-up probably of any centre in the world, and we've been very encouraged by the long-term results with this technology. It really has represented one of the major paradigm shifts in device technology that we've seen. And so really for calcified uh, femoropopliteal disease, it's now our go-to device. Uh, it's an easy balloon over a guide wire balloon angioplasty technology. It's often, apart from having drug-coated balloon angioplasty to follow, a standalone procedure. The need to bail out stent is low. And so this is very encouraging. We also know that below the knee arteries frequently are calcified and they often have medial calcification and unfortunately none of the current devices deal with medial calcification including angioplasty and atherectomy but intravascular lithotripsy does. So as, we, as we're getting more experience with the below the, 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 below the knee device, the so-called S4 device, we're getting more and more encouraged with, that, uh, with the use. And of course, we've also got this sort of scattered use in the common femoral artery and the iliacs, and we're gaining more experience there. So it's really, at the moment, a very important part of our armamentarium for endovascular treatment.